So you've been getting a couple bucks on the mean streets of Baltimore? Your name rings bells? Well, when you hit the Baltimore City Jail, you might get ransomed from right inside the jail. Knife to your throat, gotta call home, tell him to hit the stash and hand it over. The BGF, the Black Gorilla Family, the ones holding you for ransom in jail. The Black Gorilla Family street gang took over the Baltimore City Detention Center. This was one of the things that was going on back before the feds indicted the BGF led by Tavon White for running a web of corruption in what was America's oldest jail over 200 years old. Prosecutors say members of the Black Gorilla Family Street Gang used sex and money to co-opt correctional officers, convincing them to smuggle drugs and cell phones into the Baltimore City Detention Center. Part of this web of corruption you might be familiar with is the guards who got pregnant. Tavon White got three guards pregnant with four children while he was there. Some of them even got his name tattooed on them. And there were other inmates who got guards pregnant that were in the BGF. In all, investigators charged 17 inmates and 27 correctional officers in connection with the scandal. Tavon White was caught on an FBI wiretap calling out of jail and said this. This is my jail. You understand that? I'm dead serious. I'll make every final call in this jail. Everything comes through me. I'm the law. If I tell anybody there to do this, hit a police, kill someone, anything is done. The Black Gorilla Family Gang, they say that group has cut a swath of fear. In part one of my BGF series, I talked about how in 07, they seized control of the jail from the Bloods in a big... Uh, jailhouse riot. They were also taking charge of different neighborhoods on the street. So before we go into the BGF's domination of the jail, let's lay the groundwork a little bit of what was going on in the Baltimore jail period back when the Bloods ruled the roost. If you want to know what poverty in America looks like, well, this is it. Incredibly, this entire block here is pretty much made up of dilapidated, abandoned houses. Incredibly, some people are still living in between this, though. The carnage in America of crime, of drugs, of gangs, of violence, and of poverty. Well, there are a few places better to try and do that than Baltimore. July 2007, a white guy in a suburb called Rosedale flags down two carloads of young black people from Baltimore. He thinks they're coming to his house to buy this used car he has for sale. But when he approaches one of the cars, a 15-year-old leans out, boom, boom, shoots him like five times. Pearson explained that Goodman offered $2,500 to kill a witness in his friend's murder trial. That friend being Patrick Byers, who was in jail awaiting a trial for a March 2006 murder. Pearson told the court that he accepted, then got 15-year-old Jonathan Cornish to pull the trigger. Pearson also admits to calling Lackle the day of the murder to make sure that Lackle was standing outside of his home. The guy's name was Carl Lackle, and the 15-year-old was a blood named Jonathan Cornish. It may sound like an unexpected crime, but the police were well acquainted with Carl Lackle. He was about to be a witness in another homicide. Uh, Mr. Lackle enjoyed uh, a little uh, smoke and poke, cracking heroin, and one night he had been, uh, he went into Baltimore with a female acquaintance looking to get, score some stuff, and while he was on the block, boom, boom, he heard some shots. He sees a guy shoot another guy in the head, a guy named Byers. Byers runs past him, and Lackle sees him throw the murder weapon on the roof of a building, and Lackle decide, decides to become a good Samaritan. Now, whether maybe he got pressured by the police because he had caught with something, who knows. But either way, Lackle was going to be a witness, but not after Jonathan Cornish took his life. Police investigation found out that the victim, a guy named Larry Hines, were on the street. He had knocked off a couple of cousins in the neighborhood, and that Byers was the cousin's cousin. And then Lackle ID'd him out of the book and Byers was taken into custody. So Byers was affiliated with some Bloods, uh, West Side, Pasadena, Denver Lane Bloods, who operated on the east side of Baltimore. Shows you the the reach of the, uh, the name of the Bloods that people want to take on. Of course, they started in South Central LA around Century and Figueroa, the Denver Lanes, and then they got a big chapter in Pasadena, and then those 
Pasadena guys and people operating in Baltimore. They were sending them work and etc. Black gorilla. Man, this mom power roof. Nigga, fuck you talking about G. So in the investigation, they looked at Carl Lackle's uh, phone. They traced the last phone number that called them uh, about the car to a guy named Pearson who was connected to buyers. Pearson was a West Side Denver lane of blood. After that, well, I'm sure you've all seen the first 48. Pearson told the court he accepted then got 15-year-old Jonathan Cornish to pull the trigger. Pearson also admits to calling Lackle the day of the murder to make sure that Lackle was standing outside of his home. Pearson led them to buyers in the Baltimore jail who had contracted out a hit via cell phone from his jail cell. And Pearson has already pled guilty in federal court. Now, he is still on the stand as of just a few minutes ago. And as I left, the defense was asking him to explain exactly how he was getting or if he was getting a lesser sentence if he testified today. He explained, yes, he was. Guess how much the contract was for? It was $2,500. But guess how much Pearson gave to Cornish and Cornish's uh, buddy who rode along with him? $100 each. Pearson kept $2,300, gave the killer and his buddy $100 each for killing Carl Lackle, but it was under the pressure of being part of this organized blood gang that was kind of set up like a little criminal, criminal hierarchical operation. The saga of the Bloods in Baltimore is pretty interesting and includes the fact that people in the neighborhoods of Baltimore were feeling pressed by the Bloods and that's how the BGF were able to come in who initially, at least, were a little more protective of the community, but of course, supposedly, they turned to being predatory as well. And, uh, interesting side story, a guy from California that was kind of calling the shots for the uh, uh, Denver Lanes in Baltimore wanted to take over, and they were at odds with the bounty hunters out there called the Spider Gang, and but the leader of those bounty hunters ended up kidnapping Denver Lane leader and executing them. That was a whole big drama. So there was the Bloods were trying to consolidate and it probably made them weak. So boom, the BGF slides in. So what the BGF did was really nothing new. They were just continuing what who had, they had the power before them was doing. They might have made it a little more structured. But even going back to the late 90s, uh, one of the guys I interviewed for my Frank Matthews documentary, John Liddy Jones, who worked uh, with Frank Matthews back in the early 70s and was hit with a 30-year sentence in 73, he got out in maybe 96 after he served 20-some years. And within a couple of years, maybe two years, he was in the Baltimore City Jail fighting a parole violation, and he got involved or he set up a smuggling ring with corrupt guards, and uh, he ended up getting 17 and a half more years. So when I had interviewed him in 2011 or whenever, he had only been out for a few years again. So Liddy Jones spent his life in prison, in jail pretty much, but uh, even he corrupted the Baltimore City Jail, Bloods, and then this Tavon White BGF thing was just the most recent. Even he corrupted the Baltimore City Jail, Bloods, and then this Tavon White BGF thing was just the most recent in a long line. Usually there's nothing new under the sun in criminality. The places create new criminals. The criminals don't create new places. The neighborhoods are falling apart, not because the people are bad people. We're underpaid, undereducated, and so many of us have been living like this for the second and third generation until we don't even know how to change. Despair is a way of living. Of course, being a guard in a Baltimore City jail, not that desirable of a job, but in a city with high unemployment where the jail was right in the hood in East Baltimore, there were people trying to get jobs, but very few men. The men were either the kind of men that would be in that age group that either left Baltimore or they couldn't get hired. They weren't high school graduates. They couldn't pass a drug test. So at the time this was going on in the late 2000s, early 2010s, uh, the ratio of female guards was very, very high. And that's what Tavon White and the BGF preyed upon. There's text messages and letters where they lay out to each other to target female guards. They thought it was being low self-esteem. And uh, they were very successful in that. 
And of course, a jail is a place you can make a lot of money. That's why Liddy Jones was bringing stuff in. You know, $10 Percocet might go for $30. Uh, you know, $50 worth of weed, you break down and make $500. Uh, heroin, etc. So a lot of money can be made in a jail. And you might think, well, there's only a couple thousand people there. Yeah, but half of them are on drugs. They're desperate for them. And there's a lot of turnover. Guys are in jail a week. You know, they might have to spend a thousand to keep their habit going while they wait to get out. So Tavon White got introduced to the BGF when he was in prison back in the late 90s, 2000, for a homicide. So he was a serious guy. Seemed like he rose to power in the jail just because he was probably the best in manipulating the women, which was a source of the money because they were bringing in the cell phones, the tobacco. I don't know if tobacco was illegal then. The cell phones, the pills, the dope, the weed. Prosecutors say members of the Black Gorilla Family Street Gang used sex and money to co-opt correctional officers. So like I said, Tavon White got a full and full of the guards pregnant. But just hustling for money wasn't the only thing that uh, Tavon White and the BGF had going on with the guards. To control a jail full of violent criminals, you're going to have to use violence. Now 28 years old, Daquan Wallace sits in his wheelchair at the Maryland State House Wednesday, paralyzed with only limited use of his left hand. Injuries he got from an attack at the Baltimore City Detention Center, his attorney says, for not joining the Black Gorilla family. The guards would do things like leave guys out of cells or put them in certain cells and look the other way so they could be assaulted. He refused to join a gang, the Black Gorilla family gang. Attorney Larry Greenberg alleges correctional officers conspired with the gang to set up the attack, leaving Wallace alone and unprotected in an unlocked cell. The cell door was opened up, two gang members came in, they beat him, left him for dead. Eventually, it just became too obvious and the feds got some wiretaps down. Or Tavon White, the Bushman, or leader of the Black Gorilla family inside the Baltimore City Detention Center, will be the government's key witness in this case. So this happened in 2013. Uh, most of the people made plea agreements pretty quickly. In a recurring theme, the biggest gangster is often the biggest snitch. Tavon White became the star witness against well i think one or two of them was his own kids mothers who probably thought they could go to trial because he would protect him but no 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 you got to understand and the, the feds loved him. egf leader tavon white fathered five children with four separate correctional officers now white will be the star witness for the prosecution in return he'll get 12 years on the federal charges but he's already serving 20 on state charges and the sentences will run concurrently so the deal in federal court won't add any more time behind bars now just to reinforce what kind of a snake did a lot of these serious gangsters who are very very antisocial who turned state's evidence after doing all type of serious crime. Here's here's one of his moves. So in 2011, out on the street, like I said, the BGF was taking over shit on the street too, neighborhood by neighborhood, or, or different neighborhoods. I mean, I say neighborhood by neighborhood. It seems like it was a loose confederation of people, you know. So there was some neighborhood where there's a guy named Freddie Curry who's getting a lot of money, and this BGF guy targeted him. Uh, and a guy named Renard Benjamin. And Renard Benjamin kidnapped Freddie Curry's girlfriend. Curry eventually paid, according to Tavon White, between 40 and 60,000 to secure her release. But uh, he wasn't done with the situation and he, he, he squatted on Renard uh, Benjamin. And in uh, January of 2011, he caught him coming out of his girlfriend's house in the 800 block of West Pratt and he hit him. So Freddie Curry ends up getting charged with this murder and he goes to the Baltimore City Jail. Now he knew Tavon White from the streets. I don't know if he knew Tavon White was in a BGF, probably not. Because Benjamin knew, I'm sorry, Curry knew he was going to have a problem for killing a BGF. So he had a cousin in there that I guess had access to weapons or knew how to make them. So he rode up a kite and put $200 in cash in it and gave it to White. Because also the BGF guys were the trustees. They could move around a jail. Gives it to White again. I don't know if he didn't know White was in the BGF. White reads the message. Or maybe he thought White wouldn't read it or he was just taking his chances. White reads the message. He steals the 200, of course. Yeah, I don't get his knife. And then White, now this is per his own testimony, 
later when he turned state's evidence, BGF and Tavon White let the guards know they needed to get Freddie Curry, or not the guards, but some guard. And Curry was kind of left unprotected. They hit him up, but he did live and was eventually returned back to the jail and they ended up leaving him alone after Tavon White testified he was in control at the Baltimore City Detention Center and that his organization, the Black Gorilla Family, controlled the flow of cell phones, prescription drugs, marijuana, and other contraband. White also outlined how BGF conducted business inside and outside the jail. From contraband sales, he said he made $10,000 to $20,000 a month. Feds. Well, I'll tell you, I wait to be this tremendous witness while he was telling on corrupt guards. And if there's anything the feds come down on worse than a gangster, it's, it's corrupt law enforcement, as well they should. But White got the Sammy the Bull treatment. He had a couple of guards sitting in the court with him at all times. Uh, you know, comfortable. Who knows? How they, he wasn't in the jail, of course. He might have been living in a hotel or something. So Tavon White really played the system really, really well. He was living comfortable and making money when he was in the jail, and then he flipped and uh, was able to live comfortable and be highly protected by the federal government who treated him like their, their uh, well, he was their highlight reel against the corrupt guards in the Baltimore City Jail, even though he was one of the key corruptors. So this is the irony of a lot of these people they have turned state's evidence. They are the problem. The judge and prosecutors stopped short of calling Tavon White Man of the Year, but they agreed to chop off a significant chunk of his prison sentence, his reward for helping to convict 39 other people in the city jail scandal. So in 2015, the governor of Maryland uh, ordered the last part of the Baltimore city jail to be torn down. So that had been opened in 1804, so it lasted 200, 211 years. Um, whether there's corruption in the new jail at that and that level hasn't come out yet. Uh, those old jails lend it, lent themselves to problems they weren't really constructed for in the most efficient manner. And now they jam cell service around the jail. Um, I don't know why they don't do that at all jails, but maybe they're starting to, I don't know. Um, and why is this important? Well, the BGF thing is really interesting in Baltimore and just the increase in gang activity in the United States generally in the last, you know, 10 years or something. I have the hypothesis, or I bring, I think, the data shows that, you know, you have these, these pockets of geographic areas in the country where so many people have been going to prison for so long that people are just totally disconnected from the mainstream and uh, going to jail is par for the course and the government is so weak if the government is not providing basic services they're not protecting you from criminals well a new shadow government will arise thus that's where the sicilian mafia comes from sicily was the most rural part of italy the farthest away from the government with almost no protection for the rural population so the uh, Sicilian Brotherhood of Honored Men arose, the Mafia, and of course, whether they prey on the population or protected, well, it's probably a little bit of both. Same thing with these gangs, same thing with BGF and Tavon White. So, and also, you know, if you're arrested and, and you're somebody who maybe could go straight, but you have these experiences of going into a jail where the guards let you assault them, or the guards let people assault you, where you're able to buy drugs and uh, other things and have sex with guards. I mean, I've been told that many jails and prisons, you know, you can buy pussy, you know, from guards. You know, your respect for the law is gonna be low. And you realize, you know, there's sort of like criminal Illuminati, so to speak, which is what the BGF was I don't know what's going on with them in Baltimore today. They're uh, still something, unless the, you know I don't know. People just clinging on to the name, but literally, if you go through the Baltimore news from you know I don't know 2010 on to now, there's so many BGF indictments you can't keep track. 
They are responsible for the vast majority of the violence, the death, the destruction that's happening in our community. So I really couldn't count up how many that B. Jeff and Davidster were because I was getting confused which one was which, but there's been a lot. And just uh, at the end of 2022, not long ago, it was yet another one with a bunch of murders, and this included a, a hitman who had already beat a bunch of attempted murders. He's got some more murders now, and it had the popular rapper, rapper YGG Tay included in it. Federal crackdown on a Baltimore-based gang. Six alleged members of the Black Gorilla family, including Baltimore-based rapper YGG Tay, have been indicted for conspiring to take part in a violent racketeering enterprise. The alleged crimes began in 2014, which, according to the federal indictment, include six murders, 11 non-fatal shootings, attempted robberies, drug dealing, and witness intimidation. All these indictments they haven't stopped at BGF because if the phrase Black Gorilla Family is just a, an idea, right, that black people in jail who feel oppressed by the jail system or society in general really are gonna band together, well, you could keep arresting people. The idea is going to continue. Maybe for a long time, as long as the government is weak, in places like Baltimore, a shadow government shall arise. Our prophet, America, don't be more careful. So this this strip right here, this is my first. This is my first strip. When I first came here, I had this block right here. Gave out our first samples, testers. You know what I mean? Cats came back. He's like, yeah, maybe we want to fuck with that. So. You know, we had about, I think I had about maybe 200 bundles with me. You know what I mean? Just to move around and see what was what. So because you were helped, you know, you didn't come in to take over as the, the Baltimore people made plenty of money with you. So it Absolutely. wasn't, it wasn't like uh, everybody ate with us. There was no takeover. It was we coming yeah, in to get money. Everybody. everybody ate with me. I gave everybody a shot. That's what did. That's a fact. That's why I can come around here 25 years later. Now, that's an amazing thing. Humble and just pull up and just, and it's love. They seen me in 25 years. No, that's amazing, for real. Y'all, you know what I mean? Y'all got stories, man, but I got proof. I think I keep telling y'all I'm not that old. There are plenty of people who remember me. Facts. How I did what I did. Cause I can attest through. Listen, we just randomly bent a corner and pulled up. If there was anything that wasn't right, when I came through, what happened? To wreck the shit. Not sometime. They fed this man, you know what I'm saying? Not sometime, every time. Every time. I played fair, but I played hard. I did not fuck around. Period. Period. But Baltimore definitely got his own vibe. Oh, absolutely. We used to party up in that motherfucker right there, that building right there, which says Riley Walker's Adventure Foundation. Oh, really? That was a club. That was our club. That was the block club right there. A lot of, a lot of Baltimore sound was first heard in there. Cause Baltimore has its own little musical Back sound too, it was yeah. Really, really that sound that was only here. First heard in there. Then we take it down the block to the International Baltimore Coward. What's that? Down there. You know what I mean? The International, that was our local spot. You know what I'm saying? Like everybody in there. It's that big Don Beaver right there. You know what I mean? This is where this was this this all this was born here. Stuff that I ended up writing was in the world here. Burn. Hey, up. Well, this. I'll back up. Just look, you know. But stay a little close to me, so the audio. Let's get a little away from the radio. Okay. So where are we at? So, we on the west side, Baltimore, right? This is Calverton right here, right? So this is my first block that I ever had here in Baltimore. Heroin block. Yeah. I mean, here on this block, we doing, you know, doing a couple of hundred, you know, the first day. Bundles. Next day we did a, you know, bundles. No, we did a couple hundred dollars. Oh, oh. Day. Came out here, gave us some testers. People came back, said, look, this is, we had a few on us. You know, sold those real quick. Came back, sold about another thousand, came back, sold about another two, right? And I think I was finished pretty much by then. I think I had only bought like 10 bundles. Came back about four days. That's $20,000. Mm, yes, Bundles a hundred dollars ish. Okay, so we were here We rocked here for about maybe a month before we had to get the traffic off here. 
off of this main street, but like that's Frederick, that's a main thoroughfare. So to keep the traffic from having, you know, being in plain view, we came up in this. Now what, there used to be a wall here. And take it in front of me. No, honestly. It, um, it used to be, it used to be a wall here. Oh, one second. Calm them. Just, and just keep like right up on me. Okay. Yeah, so this is the uh, alley. This used to be a wall right here. This would be a, a whole building that houses their side walls. It was a solid concrete wall. Oh, right along here. So this was a tight alley. Okay. So this is a tight alley. And you solid route the customers in right here? here? Right. So TC stood up at the top of the hole right there with a shotgun on a day like this. And there would be people from right there where that red brick wall is. There will be people from that corner down to the end of this brick right here. And then the line would sometime have to separate on this side and people would be on this side along the wall, facing this way, waiting for their turn to come around and come this way. But I never did that. Once I got them all lined up, I would put somebody at either end of both lines and have them work their way in and funnel the people out both ways. And was that done like um, like every hour you just came out and banged the line? I mean it couldn't have been like constant was, or you days, tried or you tried to keep it. On some days it was constant. Oh. On some days it was constant. So if you're if a place is doing you know 25. On the days it was like every couple minutes. Every 30 minutes or so there's going to be. Did you did you let a line build up or whenever somebody came they got served? I tried to keep there like as little as much as little as possible the the the, the uh aggregation standing around. What was was not that a thing in New York though like on some of the hot huge blocks where it was like line up and then every 20 minutes we come through hit everybody then everybody scatter. Um yeah when it got like that like you know in the Bronx yeah, we used to do that, the Bronx. Because it was just a Especially ridiculous like amount of people. 80, 80, 80, 81, 82 in the Bronx. In, the ha in Harlem, it wasn't it wasn't that crazy like that. But in the Bronx, it was. It was, it was really kind of crazy like that. Just so many people? Yeah, yeah. So you'd have to come out, hit like that. But in the Bronx, we would rock from like 7 in the morning. Realistically, it's like seven in the evening, but we'd only come out from like seven to nine. And that's heroin. Oh, and that's heroin because with oh, yeah. cocaine, you really can't control when users. That's like with, always. With with with, with, with coke, it was twenty four hours, seven days a week. Which is kind of not. If you're the one selling it, that crew puts a lot of hassle on you. Yeah, I mean, people don't think about that. If you're spending twelve hours a day on the block. That means you have to have 12 hours worth of material to push during that time. You know what I mean? Like you gotta have, you gotta have that. You gotta have that uh, ability to facilitate that much, that much activity. 12 hours worth of material, and do that for you know days at a time before it's time to bounce. So once this, once once things got to a point where this alley was not long enough for us. To, you know, keep our line out of uh, the main, you know, street. We, got, we came on this street. This is Boyd. That's Pulaski. So Boyd and Pulaski became an infamous street during that period. And I had a material that we called Hammer because MC Hammer at the time was very prevalent. And, um... You remember that, huh? I heard a chuckle from over there. He remembered the hammer. Hammer in the hole. So tell them what was that? What was that like, man? How old were you then? Probably was like. Okay, come, come closer. 13, come closer. Something like that. 14, 13. So you, were you just out here trying to make? Come, 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 come close to me. Were you just out here trying to make a couple bucks? Of course, I was trying, trying to get some money. What? What is um? You know, so you're still on the same black many years later, and you're alive and free. So you knew what you were doing. What's your? You know what did what did the streets do for you? Right. <laughs> the streets did for me. The streets taught me how to be loyal, respectful, and by any means chase that money. 
Do you feel like you had a successful, successful career? Mm, no. Why? Because I was I wasn't taking heed of the teachings that he taught me by going to school. No. This has been a long time ago, and we pulled up over here, and things are still occurring. I mean, uh, is this a city that's caught in a time warp? Is it changing? What's going on here? It changed dr dramatically, like far as the kids, you know, I'm saying they, they're a lot more educated than we were coming up. I, can, I, I guess by the technology and stuff like that, but they ignorant. They don't want no teachings as far as the game and stuff. They just want to kill. You know, that's the only thing they want to do is kill. No money. They just want to kill. Why do you think that is? Don't, that rap music stuff. 